Hello everyone. So I'm uh, Emmanuel Ulmo. I'm the director of IHES, and it's a true pleasure for me to welcome you to this event. Uh, there are a few people here, but uh, and, and some. Uh, I'm very glad to have real person. Uh, uh, but uh, I also know that there are 200 people uh, joining us online from across the world. So uh, I'm glad to welcome you all. So uh, we are here today to address the issue of women under representation in science and in mathematics, particularly at IHS. Certainly, this is a complex issue, but it is also a crucial one for all of us. As long as there is only a minority of women carrying out research at the highest level in mathematics and physics, we miss out on half of the intellectual resources we have to advance, we have to advance our knowledge in these domains. While proba probably we won't be able to address the complexity of the problem of women under representation today, what I am interested in is to improve the situation here at IHS. Last month, we had the pleasure of uh, welcoming the first female permanent professor at IHS, Laure Saint-Raymond. She's an extra extraordinary uh, mathematician. Her contributions are important and profound. I'm honored that she has joined IHS, but it's also bittersweet to see that it took IHS uh, six three years to welcome its first uh, women professor, permanent professor. During the past years, IHS has been monitoring the statistics of its visitors and members. The number of these are quite disappointing. Only 10% of our visitors at the Institute are women. We also observe that uh, women are a minority when at all represented among the speakers and in the scientific committees of the conferences that we are organizing at IHS. We have explicitly asked the organizers of such events to be vigilant on this point and have included in our ethical charter um, this uh, fact. But we know and we see that it's not enough. The arrival of Flore is the occasion for us to think of what can be done to improve the situation. We think it's important to turn to experts in these issues for their advice on how to address them here at IHS. With this aim in mind, we have organized three events dedicated to that topic. Last month, we hosted a discussion with Martin Yoto, who has a long experience of supporting women in the business world to identify the lessons that an institute such as IHS can learn from what has been done elsewhere. Today, we want to go further with three women who have been active in tackling the issue of women underrepresentation in math. The one we have here today is a very international panel. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome today uh, okay, Eva, Eva Beyer Flukiger, who is well right, uh, recognized for his work on number theory. Uh, I've known Eva for several years now. Uh, during her career, she was a visiting professor at IHS uh, several times. She's currently professor emeritus at uh, EPFL, uh, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And Welcome, uh, Eva, and thank you for being with us today. So, uh, Catherine Leonard, who is a professor of computer science at the Occidental College, Los Angeles, and director of the Center for Undergraduate Research in Mathematics. She has been the president of AWM, the Association for Women in Mathematics. So, AWM celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, and we are very happy to partner with them for this event, as well as for the Friends of IHS Gala that will take place on November 16 in New York. Uh, Catherine 
is on a sabbatical this year and she has just spent a few weeks in France. So we are very lucky to have her here at the Institute today. So welcome, uh, Catherine. It's really nice to have you uh, in true life, in person. <laughs> so Andrea Walter uh, is a professor of mathematical optimization at the Institute for Mathematics of Humboldt University in Berlin. She's currently convener together with Kai Kupjes of the European Women Mathematics. I had the chance to meet her through a Zoom just a few months ago uh, when we contacted EWM to ask for their advice. So it's a real pleasure to see you again, Andrea. Thank you for being with us today. So the three of them will have a lot to tell about their experience as women mathematicians who managed to become accomplished researchers despite all the obstacles that they have encountered along the way. We are very eager to listen about their recommendations and insights. Eva, Catherine and Andrea will be interviewed by Méline Ruel, a second year student at Centrale Supélec, a prestigious engineering school that is part of Université Paris-Saclay. She was admitted with great results and having followed a scientific and international program in Lyon. I know that she's very enthusiastic about being here with us today. I'm very happy to welcome you here at IHS, Medine. So without further ado, I leave the floor to you, Medine, Eva, Andrea, and Catherine. Thank you. And the matters at hand today are uh, of interest to me because I am uh, the vice president of the student club in Central Supélec advocating for women's rights on uh, campus. And I would love nothing more than to jump in uh, today's discussion. So uh, Emmanuel Ulmo just introduced our three panelists, uh, Catherine, Andrea and Eva. Could you please tell us a little bit more about your connection to today's topic and why it's important to you? Uh, maybe starting with Catherine. Thanks, Milene. Um, so I was introduced as a professor of computer scientist, but I, uh, of science, but I'm actually a mathematician. My PhD is in math, uh, and the more time I spend with computer scientists, the more convinced I am that I'm a mathematician. Uh, but their tent is large, and they let me slip under it. Uh, my connection to the topic today is, well, I am a woman in math. Um, but more than that, I, I guess um, I... I have a difficult relationship with my gender, maybe. Uh, my family was very conservative, and there were things that women were supposed to do and things that women were not supposed to do, or girls. And I was constantly wanting to do the things that I wasn't supposed to do, and then doing them anyway, and then being told that I wasn't really a woman or a girl at the time. Um, and so at this point, I'm like deeply, deeply attached to being a woman, because I feel like I really had to fight for it, <laughs> and so uh, somehow, somehow I want that recognized. But um, I've since in graduate school, I've been organizing communities of women um, in math, and now I'm currently the president, um, as Emmanuel mentioned, of the Association for Women in Math. So um, more of a leadership position now than just getting grad students together. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. Uh, maybe following up, we could hear about your uh, experience, uh, your connection to today's topic, Eva, maybe. So uh, my connection is that, uh, so uh, on one hand, because uh, as Emmanuel said, uh, so I have visited IHS several times, so this is why he thought of me. And also because uh, uh, I'm very interested in this topic of uh, underrepresentation of uh, women in, among the mathematicians. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, one of the uh, founders of, uh, of the uh, European Women in Mathematics. Uh, that, that was in uh, 1987. So at that time, it was not yet an association. It was just an informal group. It actually all started in Paris when I was uh, uh, visiting uh, IHS, by the way. And I got an invitation, uh, I think, from Carolai Series. Uh, and so there were maybe 10 or 15 uh, uh, women mathematicians there. Uh, and uh, 
I, th I thought it was uh, wonderful because uh, previously I didn't meet so many women mathematicians and at the same time to think 10 or 15 of them, some of them a little bit more senior than me. Uh, so that for me, that is wonderful. And so I wanted to be involved in this sort of uh, uh, organizations. And uh, so I was uh, among, among many other friends, I was uh, one of those who developed this European uh, women in mathematics. Uh, that eventually became an association and, and grow, it has grown a lot. And uh, so maybe two, two years ago, there was a, a conference in Graz uh, to celebrate the 30th uh, anniversary. Uh, and uh, I was very happy to, to be there and to see uh, uh, more than 50 women gathered there, many young ones and so on. So I was also uh, among the, the uh, founders of uh, Family Mathematics, a French uh, association. And uh, uh, later on, also, I, I was uh, many times uh, involved in uh, more or less formal ways in, in these sort of activities. Okay, thank you. And uh, to finish it off, uh, Andrea, could you uh, explain your connection to the topic? During my career, I experienced at different points that networking is really important and that it's also more difficult for women to do this networking. And therefore, now that I'm in a leading position, I really, it's really at my heart that I support and promote women by also supporting this networking. And for this reason, I also organize a series of workshops, Women in Optimization in Germany. And I'm also acting as a convener for the European Women in Mathematics. So this is really at my heart to support and promote women. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so yes, the three of you are now established, uh, established uh, researchers. What obstacles did you encounter along the way and how were they related, if at all, to your gender, uh, starting with Catherine? Thanks. Um, so in high school, I was very good at both math and English. Um, I was top of my class in both, but the advisor told me to go into English. So when I went off to college, I majored in English. Um, so I don't know if that's an obstacle, but I think it's a good example of um, failure to support or failure to recognize or, or something like that. Um, then, um, you know, as a younger mathematician going to, going to conferences, I would be one of a few women. I mean, I think we can see how far we've come since I was a graduate student just in the line for the women's restroom at conferences. I don't know if that's true here as well, but in the US used to be empty. Now there's actually a line, which is great. Um, but at conferences, relationships are often built like over a beer after the conference and being one of a few women in a group of men and fears of sexual harassment and actual sexual harassment mean that you don't get invited for the beer. Or if you do get invited for the beer, it's not talking about math that the person had in mind. And so um, the kind of natural networks that often arise for men in those um, situations often don't arise for women unless there are a lot of women there um, to sort of neutralize that tension. Um, now I'm kind of invisible. People think that I'm like the wife of a mathematician <laughs> or they think I'm a, in the US it's called a soccer mom. Here it would be a football mom. Um, and so, so that's a whole different kind of framework. So I would say that over time these obstacles have changed and that itself is another obstacle where I'm having to constantly learn new tools to deal with a new situation that I hadn't realized I would have had to deal with. Um, and so this leads to a leaky pipeline that I'm sure you've heard about, that at various different stages, women just don't progress to the next level. Um, and in some sense, I'm also part of the leaky pipeline because I was sort of set off to have a high-powered research career, and I decided for personal reasons not to do that and to live in Los Angeles and to take the job that I could get that would let me be in Los Angeles. So, so the leaky pipeline is real. Um, and then I'll just end by pointing out that they've done studies that show that women have to get like twice as many points as men in order to be evaluated the same. So they would take the, there are studies where they take the same CV and they put a man's woman at the top or they put a woman's 
name at the top. And the same is true for uh, in the US for um, Spanish last names, for names that are sort of traditionally associated with black American communities. Um, and the sort of sense of the quality of the person whose CV you're looking at changes depending on the name. So this shows us that we all, and, and that's true like of everyone, Every all of the evaluators have this. It's not just that men are badly evaluating women, it's that we all are. So, um, so we have these kind of unconscious predispositions for or against people. Who do we give the benefit of the doubt to? Who do we not? So that's real too. I see, yes. Uh, um, what about you, um, Ava? Could you talk uh, about obstacles maybe? Sure. So uh, actually, uh, I did um, encounter some obstacles uh, so quite early because uh, I decided uh, very early that I wanted to be a mathematician. So I was maybe 14, 15 years old. And uh, uh, so I wanted to be a mathematician and more specifically to do research in mathematics. Uh, and I told my parents, OK, so, uh, you know, don't have to worry about me anymore. I know what I want to uh, be when I'm a grown up. I want to be a mathematician. And they were so upset. So they said, no, 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 that's not a good idea. And uh, they didn't explain. Me. OK, so uh, I sort of. Uh, uh, they didn't even say explicitly that because I'm a girl, but uh, uh, they just didn't want me to do that. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay, so that was a very serious obstacle because so when I was uh, 14, so they said, okay, it's not a good idea, but let's wait. Uh, okay, you will change your mind later. <laughs> okay, then I didn't change my mind. And so it became a real obstacle by the time I wanted to go to university because they didn't want me to study mathematics. And so this uh, led to a conflict with my parents, which is a very serious, concrete uh, obstacle. Okay, so uh, I don't want to explain more about that. It's not a personal. <laughs> but uh, then, uh, so anyway, uh, I, I studied mathematics and uh, I was not living with my parents anymore. I was actually I had to, to work to make a living uh, and uh, uh, I was uh, in Geneva, the University of Geneva and I discovered that uh, uh, all the, the whole faculty was only men. So professors, assistants, everybody uh, was uh, male and so this for me it was a bit of a shock because uh, uh, okay so it was not an obstacle to study. I could uh, could register and, and go to, to classes and, and so on. But my aim was to be uh, uh, to do research in mathematics. And I understood that uh, uh, that meant that in a few years, I would be one of these people who now uh, were teaching mathematics to me. And um, so, of course, this sent a message that it's not going to be very easy. Yeah. Because what are your chances <laughs> okay, to, to become a professor of mathematics if uh, there are none, right? So no. it's a bit, bit difficult. So, uh, okay, yes. but anyway, uh, I didn't give up. I'm, okay, I studied mathematics and, uh, and then um, I wanted a PhD because this, of course, is also the way of becoming a, a researcher in mathematics. And uh, so I found an advisor uh, who was quite supportive and uh, so everything went fine with him. So uh, that, was, that was wonderful. And I'm sure that for my supervisor, it was, uh, there was no difference. I mean, uh, 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 that I was a man or a woman. So uh, we talked about mathematics. That was, uh, it was just great. Uh, on the other hand, so, um, okay, with the other people in the department, uh, so some of the people were very friendly, some of the people ignored me totally. Uh, so, I mean, from that, I got sort of the image also that I was not at the right place. I see. And, yeah. among the, among, and that also, interestingly, about the nice ones. So I remember the one who was quite friendly and was ready to, to talk about mathematics uh, with me and uh, have coffee and so on. So it, it was perfect. But then uh, when he learned that I wanted a PhD in mathematics, so he told me, but you are married. It is not the right age to have children. Surely that's more important. You don't, why do you want a PhD? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so I understand. I, I, okay. So if I remember this, it's because it, uh, okay, didn't stop me doing anything. But, uh, okay, it's also a message that, uh, yes. 
there is a problem. Could have been an obstacle. And the problem here. And uh, anyway, so um, I'm, I, I continued and uh, I worked on my PhD, I finished. And uh, then, uh, so uh, the sort of thing that Catherine mentioned that, okay, so I remember I, I went to my first conference in Oberwerfach that was a bit, bit before my PhD even. And so I was so excited to be there so that I didn't even notice that uh, who were the other people. I didn't know anybody uh, because I was new. And, and then, uh, okay, so I give my talk uh, Wednesday morning and so people who know about Rolfrak know that uh, there is a, an excursion in the afternoon. And so then uh, some people told me, you know, weren't you uh, uncomfortable speaking uh, in front of 40 men? <laughs> So mm -hmm. I would must have been. Give a talk in front of 40 women. And by the time I realized, okay, so they are all men, right? So I, uh, happily it was after my talk, I didn't feel uncomfortable. It was all about mathematics. And, and I did okay. uh, talk, talk with all these people. So, but but uh, repeatedly after that, you know, so uh, you go to a conference and, uh, and where you are yes. the only woman and all there are maybe, maybe two of us. So not very many. Yeah. So we might expand on that later, actually. Yeah. Yes, I, I think well, we'll I mean, come back exactly to that yeah. topic. And then, yes. uh, okay, so the, the maybe the worst obstacle was then uh, that uh, then I became a postdoc and I was a postdoc for 10 years. Yes, but I'd like to hear... Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm th thank you, Ava. I, I'd just like to hear about uh, Andrea's experience as well with uh, perhaps obstacles that uh, she faced. Yeah, I definitely faced few obstacles and the main one was so I have two daughters so they are not the obstacles but well if you have a child you have to coordinate the child care and your research and this is already a challenging topic or issue and um, on the other hand so the most productive time for researcher when you really want to uh, publish paper and well work actively this is also the most reproductive time for a woman and therefore these really um, yeah this is a conflict so you have on one hand to coordinate your work that you want to do so the research with the child care and on the other hand you have to well uh, confront yourself with the attitudes of other people towards working mothers so this is so it really depends in the society where you live. But in Germany, we have this term Rabenmutter, so that you don't care for your child if you work. And this was one of the uh, yeah, main obstacles. So to really yes. go against this. I see. OK, uh, well, there must have been times when uh, you all three of you felt a bit helpless. Um, so to that regard, in that regard, could, if you could talk to your younger self today, uh, what advice would you give her? Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, so when I look back, I would actually not change that much. So there's no special advice where I would say, well, at this point, you should go in another, in another direction. So I'm quite happy with the path that I followed. But what, what would have helped me at some point is that you, well, the, that somebody said to me, well, do what you like, because this is where you are good at, if you are really convinced about and you, well, yeah, really burn for something. And um, this is one thing, do what you like and trust in yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, following up, maybe Catherine, uh, if you had an advice. Yeah, uh, so number one is to take care of your mental health. Somehow we're okay with taking care of our physical health and letting our physical health uh, make us take a break when, it, when we need one, uh, but we aren't as good with mental health. Um, but uh, if, you know, we all need joy, so find more joy. I didn't have a lot of joy for some time. Um, I would say find people like you. Uh, for, so when you're one of a small number of people in a particular group, um, it's easy to believe that everything that doesn't go perfectly right for you is because of you and there's something wrong with you, but often it's not you, it's the system, or it's something that everybody's experiencing. And so when I 
talked with a bunch of women in graduate school, I found out that they were all feeling the same way I was, and it wasn't that I was just didn't belong here. It was that it was a common experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I'd say find mentors and everyone. So everyone has something to teach you. Uh, even the people who are torturing you have something to teach you that you can take from them. I wouldn't say that I had one, like I've never had someone who I've like modeled my life on, but I have taken things from everyone that I've met. Mm -hmm. um, that said, just be aware of survivor bias. Like those of us who have made it survived, right? Like really somehow we should be talking to the people who didn't make it <laughs> if we really want to. So just be aware that when people give you advice and it doesn't feel right, trust yourself. Like Andrea said, you know what's right for you. You're the only one who knows what's right for you. And so, um, you know, trust yourself, I think is great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And maybe what about you, um, uh, Ava? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, uh, about advice to give to my younger self, actually, uh, yes. so Andrea, uh, I think that uh, what I did was, uh, was, was uh, the right thing. So I, it wouldn't change anything, actually, in what I did. So uh, it was not always easy, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't change the, the actual decisions that, that, uh, that I made. So uh, I, I don't, <laughs> don't think that I have uh, much of an advice. And I think what Catherine just said, it's... Uh, quite relevant that uh, uh, we have survived. So maybe you should be asking the people who didn't. So he who yeah. gave up and, uh, and so why that was and what uh, they think that uh, could have been done differently. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, now that you have gained experience as a supervisor and as a mentor, how do you shape your behavior uh, towards the students or young researchers you supervise? in order to change things uh, for them, uh, starting with uh, Catherine. Um, sure. So as I mentioned, I started in college in English, and there was a math request. So in the US, you have to take classes from all different subjects. You don't specialize early the way that happens here in Europe. And so I was an English major, but I had to take a math class. And so I petitioned the university to get out of the math class. <laughs> Uh, and they were like, nope, we have that there for a reason. And it was the first time that I had math taught by a real math, like a research level mathematician who understood the structures behind the techniques that he was teaching. Um, and he actually reached out to me and said, have you considered being a math major? Uh, and that completely changed my trajectory. I jammed in a bachelor's degree in a year and a half and went off to grad school and and you know here i am today so um, i try to be that person to my students um, tell like making a conscious effort to reach out to them and tell them the strengths and the talents that i see in them because they probably don't see them themselves all the time um, and then uh show that math requires comfort with failure. So with students, I try to celebrate the failures. Like, isn't that great? You thought this was true and it's not. Like, this is exciting. Your whole view of the world is about to change. Uh, and so I try to make it, and I try to show my own failures, you know, like often I'll tell a student, well, let's start with this approach. And then the student comes all shy back to me being like, oh, I must have done something wrong. It didn't work. I'm like, oh no, that actually didn't work. I was wrong. Hooray. I've learned something new, right? So, so someone once described math as the progress, as the process of becoming progressively less wrong. Like we got to be okay with being wrong. So I, I try to model that for students. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, following up, uh, Andrea, what about you? So again, looking back at my career, I, there were several points where somebody stood up for me and spoke for me. So one example was when I was promoted to a junior professorship, there was the question, should I be promoted or not? And somebody said, well, she was not upgrade. So she did not spend enough time at it in a different country. But at that point, I had my younger daughter was two or three years old. And somebody stood up and said, well, she has this young daughter. How could she spend a long time abroad? So I had two months or something like this. And so somebody stood up and said this. this and then it was not the question that I was promoted. So this was a very important experience. So the person told me this afterwards. And for me, 
as a consequence, if I um, well notice something like this, then I stand up and speak for people. And I think this is really important. And another point uh, that is very important for me is that if you is that if you analyze the behavior of women, that women often concentrate on their shortcomings instead of their strength. And this is also true for presentations, research presentations, when they present their work. And this is a tendency that women have. And if it's feasible, I try to speak with them and point them to this fact. So these are the two, two aspects that I really concentrate on supporting people. Okay, thank you. And uh, lastly, um, Eva, could you tell us about um, what would you do to change things? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, about uh, my attitude to students and the mentoring. So, uh, yes, I have had a number of uh, PhD students, diploma students, so also master students and uh, postdocs. And I uh, enjoyed working with them very much. So uh, try to uh, encourage them and, and help them. Uh, so it was, uh, of course, in different ways because they all have different personalities. So it's uh, uh, the way you have to advise one person is not the same as uh, another one. Uh, so I would say I was very attentive to uh, uh, to their needs and to their personalities, to their objectives, uh, so what they really wanted to achieve and how to do it. Uh, and uh, of course, my experience helped me that. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I did that for, for men and women, uh, because I had uh, students indifferently. Uh, and, but I noticed that uh, the fact that uh, I'm a woman professor uh, was important to, to, to the women, so at least some of them. So that uh, uh, it was not like for me when I was a student that uh, there were no male, only male professors. So they could see that there was somebody who had already uh, uh, succeeded. And, uh, and uh, um, so, of course, uh, then uh, the university also organized some, uh, some discussions with the women students, so which also helped this, uh, this aim. And then, then, of course, I just uh, tried to explain about myself what I did, and, uh, and, and so they could learn from this experience. And uh, so, Andrea, uh, um, uh, mentioned also presentation. So this is also something I did uh, rather systematically uh, with men and women, but when they had to give a talk or maybe present themselves for an interview or uh, for a position, a junior position. Uh, so we, we took uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with other students uh, uh, an afternoon or a day. And uh, so everybody, so to exercise this, this presentation. So I found that that was very helpful. Uh, the other students could also uh, tell what they, uh, I mean, they, they made some remarks, uh, but it's good that a more senior person is there because we were on the other side to, to, to judge the candidates. So, uh, so I, I, I found that that was very helpful for, for the students. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answers, which are simple but important changes that senior researchers can put into place at the indi individual scale. Uh, but tonight we are also here to focus on what institutions such as uh, IHES or uh, Université Paris-Saclay can do to help fill the gender gap in science and more specifically in mathematics. There is an objection that is often made against positive discrimination. That is, women can find themselves in a difficult situation where they wonder if they were chosen on the basis of merit or of gender, um, triggering the so-called imposter syndrome. When we want the only criterion to select candidates to be excellence, how can an institution still put an emphasis on the importance of diversity while avoiding these pernicious effects? Uh, what do you think, uh, Ava? Yeah, so um, we, have, we heard that there are only 10% uh, uh, women visitors uh, uh, among the visitors at IHS. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so uh, uh, in a previous discussion, not, not today, uh, so we are told that uh, it is also the percentage of applications. So, I mean, that means that there is no, there is no discrimination, I think, actually. Uh, the thing is that, uh, okay, so... But on the other hand, I, I understand that uh, IHS would be concerned. It's not, not a high number, 
right? So why there are so few? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I would, I'm not sure, but uh, what I would try to, to understand, so before doing something, I think we need to understand the situation, so why this is so. And uh, uh, I would look at other uh, research institutes. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, the MSRI, it seems to me that there is always a fair number of uh, women at MSRI, but I don't have these, these statistics. So uh, why, don't, why don't you look at that and, and, uh, and, and understand what they do differently? Of course, MSRI, so at the Research Institute in Berkeley, so they have programs. Okay, so how, how does one get to a research institute? So uh, in the case of uh, MSRI, it's, uh, you get a letter of invitation because uh, it's a program and uh, the uh, people who are in this area get an invitation. So in uh, IHS, it may be a bit different because there are no programs. So how do people even hear about, I mean, uh, young, young people, uh, how do they hear about IHS at all? So. Uh, uh, I guess in my case, so when my advisor told me, uh, you know, uh, it's good to go to IHS, and then so so told me that uh, you could go, and and then once I was there, okay, so I uh, I said goodbye, and then uh, they would say, oh, it was great that you were here, and why don't you come again? So it's sort of informal thing. So it doesn't have to be maybe formal invitations. It's not possible, but uh, uh, so from my experience of going to institutes. Um, uh, in, I mean, uh, there, are, uh, there are quite a number of them uh, in Germany, and of course, IHS in France, in the United States, there are several. So um, I think people do expect to be, to be invited. And so this, this is something that uh, one could develop. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, what about you, Andrea? Um, what do you think about this? Okay, another example from my from my career. So at one point, I prepared a grant proposal for e ECR, so from e ERC grant. So and I was invited to Brussels. So I made it to the last I don't know twenty applicants, but I did not get the ERC grant. And so I was really disappointed and talked about this with a colleague. And he said, "Well, if you make it there, your application was definitely very good. Otherwise, you could not make it there." And then the question is, how would you distinguish excellence at this level? So you can't count papers because, well, they are different kind of journals, different kind of, well, people work together on groups so or alone. So you have your paper on your own or with others together. So at that level, it's really hard to judge excellence. What, what is excellence? And therefore, in my opinion, if you made it to this level that you are in this group of 20, or you made the, ro the, the step from the whole group of applicants to the last 10% or something, this is already a judgment of your quality. And then I think it's completely fair to say, now we take additional criteria into account, like the gender, for example. And therefore, I'm, I'm happy with this positive discrimination. Okay. Yes, I see. Um, what about you, Catherine? What do you think we could do? I agree completely with what Andrea just said. I've never been on a review committee where we didn't have enough excellent candidates for the positions we were trying to match. Um, and uh, I'll just refer back to those studies I was mentioning earlier that show that women and people from minoritized racial and ethnic groups have to have more points on, on the same, like the same CV to be thought of in the, as at the same level. So um, the people who are, the people from those groups who are in that excellent pile are probably actually better. They probably have more points and just our unconscious biases are um, sort of at play there. Um, and so just keeping that in mind, I, I think, uh, can go a long way. Just making a conscious decision to keep this in mind and to, to make uh, having a, a well-rounded group of people a high priority. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, thank you. Um, well, the IHS uh, hopes to raise funds at the Friends of IHS Gala on Women in Fundamental Research to be held on November 16th, as uh, Mr. Ulmo mentioned. What initiatives could an institution such as IHS or Université Paris-Saclay uh, implement to initiate change? 
Could you suggest uh, specific ideas for programs that would function on, let's say, a, a $50,000 budget? Um, Catherine, maybe first? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, I think one important thing to do is just be visible in your commitment. That goes a long way. You know, when you look at the website and it's 49 white guys and one woman, that really sends, that sends a message to people who, not that they wouldn't be welcome here, but that it's like not the place for them. So I think having those visual representations is really important. And then um, I'll just take a few minutes to talk about um, a, some programming that the AWM uh, instituted um, about 10 years ago. We have these research networks for women uh, and they aren't just limited to women. Some of them are, but not all of them are. Uh, but the idea is that um, uh, six or seven senior researchers in a research area um, select open problems to work on and then participants apply to be part of the project groups that those women lead. And then the people come together for a week of really intensive active research, like very few talks, all, all mostly work. Um, and then at the end of the week, they've like made progress, they've under learned, they've come to know each other and then continuing the collaboration remotely um, afterward uh, just builds, builds incredible relationships. So the first one of these was Women in Numbers and it started in 2008 at the Banff International Research Station in Canada. Um, and in the years following, the number of women speakers invited at the top number theory conferences just steadily grew and grew and grew. So the women themselves were having a community that they felt comfortable in, were not dealing with the let's just go have a beer issue that I talked about earlier. Um, and they were creating a public presence where people, conference organizers now knew there's this group women in, women in numbers, we want some speakers, let's go find them. Um, and so now there are networks in over 25 areas. I'm in shape modeling and uh, mathematics of data science, um, but there are many, many more and new ones are constantly forming. And so I don't know if um, IHES would be interested in having this kind of research collaboration conference. It wouldn't need to just be limited to women, but if you have the senior leaders be women and a bulk of the participants be women, just that kind of, like the visuals, the visuals again are incredibly powerful. Mm, I see. Um, what, would you, what do you think about uh, solutions, uh, Andrea? Okay, so um, I mentioned already earlier my, my attempt to stay a, a certain time abroad. And at that time, I already had a daughter and it was very difficult to take her with me. So possibilities to take the kids with you, that's really very, very helpful. And so in Germany, you usually have the hours from, I don't know, half past eight to five or something. And this is then somewhat limited. So it would be helpful to have a childcare also for, for the whole day. It's not that you want to put your, give your child away all the day usually, but for the special events where you have a research day, some research day somewhere, or when you have a visitor, that is very helpful to have an organized childcare where you can, where you know that there's really somebody who takes care of your kid. And for example, at the university where I was before, they had this um, kids at the university where somebody took care of the kids until eight in the evening. So again, this was not the usual setup, but if you have a visitor, you could, you, you could bring your kid there and then you know everything is all right. Okay, okay, um, thank you. And uh, Eva, could you finish off with uh, this uh, $50,000 budget? So actually, uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot <laughs> add anything to, to what was already said. So uh, uh, I think that uh, what Catherine and Andrea proposed makes a lot of sense and uh, it looks good. So um, no additional ideas. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for your ideas. Uh, we also need to make sure that the actions we implement are in the right direction. Uh, how can we measure the efficiency of the initiatives that were just mentioned, uh, starting with Catherine? Um, so, I mean, I think, I think, I think just measuring, you know, the simplest thing to do is just count how many people applied, how many people were accepted, um, things like that. Just keep, 
keeping really basic levels of um, accounting, and then um, surveying people who come from the groups they are trying to attract and learning more about their experiences. Um, and then I guess I'll just, this is a very US centric example and I apologize for that, but. <laughs> um, so Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the second woman on the US Supreme Court, which is the highest court of the country. And she was interviewed and asked, uh, so, you know, like, is this enough women? It's two out of nine now. Is that like, when, when is it enough? And she said, there have been nine men on the Supreme Court for 200 years. So it will be enough when there are nine women on the Supreme Court. Um, and I don't say that because I think that now this room should be all full of men and uh, of women and, and not men, but it's more just to point out like balance, like we're striving for a balance. And so um, when you have the balance, I think people will stop talking about the, like we won't have this panel anymore because people will all feel like their voices are heard. They all have the opportunities that they want. Okay, I see. Um, then following up, uh, Andrea, how can we measure the efficiency of uh, initiatives? Well, it's always important to take the feedback from the visitors or from the participants of the program into account because this also always gives you ideas how to improve things. And this is what I found very helpful with these. So, for example, the the optimization, uh, women and optimization workshops, because then you get new ideas also and improve the programs that you have. Okay, okay. thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, and, and then finishing, finishing off, uh, Eva, Eva? Yeah, do you have uh, Yeah, I also think that, uh, of course, you have to, to count, so how many, uh, whether it uh, increased the number of visitors, of course, and as for feedback, so, and, uh, uh, including, uh, I think it would be interesting to know how how people come to 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 know about IHS. How why do they apply? Uh, this sort of questions so uh, in, to include in the in the feedback to understand better what's going on, and then then of course one can take that into account and do it even better next time. Okay. Uh, I see. Well, uh, this will be the last question for me. After that, we will uh, be taking questions from the audience and uh, people online. Um, so in an effort to promote diversity and inclusion, some institutions recommend to be extremely careful with language as well as uh, with the images used in communication materials by making sure they are gender neutral, as uh, Catherine mentioned. This is particularly relevant for certain languages such as French, but it is also a complex and sensitive issue in France currently, as the solutions that have been found so far can appear pretty cumbersome. Uh, what is your position about this, uh, Eva? So I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm not interested in this issue. So, okay, I know that uh, uh, this has been discussed a lot and I'm sure that Catherine and Andrea are, uh, we'll have something, something to say about it. So personally, um, I'm not interested and I think that uh, sometimes when one spends time to, to talk about it, this uh, one doesn't speak about more important issues, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, then Andrea? So, um, so this gender neutral language is also a very, very hot topic in Germany right now because we have all the male words for, I don't know, doctor, for example, which is their arts. So and the picture that you have in mind is a group of men. And therefore, I think that it's really important to take care of this gender neutral language. I am also convinced that this would not solve the problem, but I think it's a big step also for the kids. So my observation, it's really important. So we lose the women in math already at a very early age. And if they have these pictures in mind that while a professor is a man, is a white man, if you have the picture. And if you use this gender neutral formulation, then it's a step towards a change in, the, in mind. And therefore I, I really like this discussion about the gender neutral language. Okay, well, me too. <laughs> and uh, well, finishing off, uh, Catherine? 
So English doesn't have quite the same gendered issues that uh, the Romance languages do. So, uh, you know, I was talking to, so in Spanish, there's an el la instead of el or la, and I think similar conversations are happening in French. Um, but we do have gendered words. So um, stewardess was, is, was the word for flight attendants on airplanes, which is very gendered, um, and now we call them flight attendants. So there has there there are words like this that people have worked very hard to change. Um, but I, I actually think it's super important because I think that language builds these kind of unconscious biases that Andrea mentioned and that we were talking about before. Um, so it like just our baseline assumptions about who's gonna do what. Um, uh, really rest on these on these kind of unconscious things. So so I think it's super important. And it's also important because um, more and more, certainly gender roles are social constructions. Um, and more and more, we're seeing that gender itself is a construction and moving from this idea of a gender binary to a gender spectrum. Uh, and so as soon as you have, as soon as you move into that frame, I mean, the like, I don't, I honestly don't know what the gendered languages are, are going to be able to do with that. Um, but I think the conversation about uh, the words themselves is a necessary part of that larger conversation. Uh, and I have to say, it's a really interesting time to be the leader of a gender-based organization, because at the same time that uh, women are still you know, fighting some important fights, um, in, we're, we're having having a gender-based organization is kind of reinforcing that gender binary that um, that is in the process of changing. So I'm curious to see uh, how we navigate all of that. Okay. Uh, yes, I am too. Uh, thank you. Well, I think we will now take questions from the room and the audience uh, online. So uh, if you want to ask a question, just uh, let me know. Yes. So you spoke on this very interesting problem of the people that didn't make it, sort of. I guess that as being in organized in these organizations, you have asked those people what are the reasons. And what I would be interested in is, first of all, what are these reasons why people stop their career in mathematical, or women stop? And uh, at which stage is this mm -hmm. most, uh, like, is it on a bachelor, master, postdoc, PhD? Yeah, so I mean, I so th this is a US study that I'm about to talk about, but <clears throat> uh, eighth grade seems to be a really crucial time where uh, students, women students who, girl students, <laughs> who have been excelling in, in math uh, up until that point suddenly get the message that they aren't supposed to like math, and so they start acting like they aren't good at math. So that's a big one. Um, <clears throat> So for a long time, uh, college was another place where women were kind of tracked out of math. I mean, the leaky pipeline is, was invented as a metaphor be, to, to show that these leaks happen all along the way. I think Andrea made a good point about the childbearing years. Um, <clears throat> There's also the, are you getting a relationship kind of period as well? <laughs> um, so when uh, two academic, so you meet someone in graduate school, you're both then academics, you both need to get jobs. If you both want the same kind of job, one of you is going to have to sort of give up something, you know? So, so I think there are a lot of places, <clears throat> but, uh, an answer to the first question, which I think is more interesting, have we done extensive inter interviewing with people? We tend to interview those people like on their way out. So I'm dropping out of graduate school uh, and you come and ask me why. Uh, I don't think I have the perspective to be honest with myself or with you or even to fully understand the situation that brought me to that point. And I don't know of any study that looks longer term, go, like goes back to those people in 10 years and says now with the wisdom of the years, like what do you think actually happened? And I, and I think that would be super interesting. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Ava and Andrea, did you hear the question? Uh, um, so in my experience, it's the step after the study towards the PhD. So in Germany, we have the bachelor master and then you do the PhD. And if you talk to male students then and asked, well, 
I think you can do it. Would you be interested in a PhD position? Then they usually, well, say more or less just, yeah, I try it. And if you talk to female students at that point, well, hmm, I don't know, do I have really the ability to do this? So they're not that self-confident as men are at that point. And this is, and I talked about this also with a lot of colleagues, this is a very important point to convince female students to actually pursue a PhD. This is one of the really critical points. Eva, uh, do you want to add something or should I go on to ask the next question that arrived online? <laughs> no, I, I think yeah. it's fine to ask the last. I, I think it's a very important issue, but uh, I also don't know. So it's. Uh, I think we should really, I mean, somebody you know, should investigate this and ask women who, who have dropped out to so why and, and follow up and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a hard question. So uh, we have a, a few questions online, so I, I will start with one coming from Corina Ulsi-Gray, who is a mathematician, and says, uh, I very much believe in the importance of role models. I am less convinced of the importance of fixed quotas of women in committees, etc. What is your view on that matter? How do we increase the visibility of women without overburdening the too few that we have now? Maybe I can start. So I work in applied mathematics, also with a lot of projects together with engineers and computer scientists. So it happens really frequently that I'm the only woman or we are just two or something like, so a really low number. And to my experience, it changes the discussion in the committees a lot if there's at least one woman in this committee. And therefore, I'm really in favor for quotas. I know that this puts a burden on the females, on the women that made it to this leading position, but I think it's an important service to the community that we have to make. So I, I know that in France, there is this 50-50 committee uh, condition. We don't have this in the US. Um, so it's a little bit different, but I mean, I would I would say um, from the women colleagues that I've spoken with in France, it is really like they are exhausted, you know, and this affects their research trajectories as well because they're spending time in bureaucracy instead of doing research. Um, so I might try to identify the committees where it's super important to have women as part of the conversation, like hiring committees and PhD committees and, and things like this, and then let the, I don't know what you have committees for, but let's say the, you know, lunch at faculty meetings committee or whatever, the men can have that. Um, but I also think this is a great charge to the universities. You wanna have 50% of the women on committees? Have 50% of the professors be women. I mean, that's an easy solution. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Eva? Eva, do you want to add something or? Uh, yeah, so again, it's it's really a difficult question. So my experience <laughs> is also that uh, so I have been on uh, a, a number of uh, selection committees, hiring committees, uh, a selection for uh, uh, talks, and so on, and I really found that. Uh, uh, it makes a difference when there's a woman because, uh, okay, so the, 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 uh, the members of the, the, the committee uh, uh, make uh, proposals of uh, speakers or whatever. Uh, and uh, then very often the first names that come are, are men uh, because, uh, so we have this, uh, uh, this picture of, you know, there was this movie picture of scientists. So that's what Andre also said. We have the image uh, from child on that a scientist is a, a man. And people who, for instance, who propose uh, speakers for a conference, they think of those who uh, spoke at the last conference, they were mostly or exclusively men. And so they will propose men. And then, so if, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody, you know, that's like a woman or somebody who is interested in this topic said, okay, so 
look what you have proposed, only, only men. So don't you think that in this topic there are also women? And then well, most of the time they would say, oh yes, of course, there is so and so and so and so, well, are just as good as those we propose. So it is very useful. So going for 50%, I think it's, it's probably a bit too much. And, and so I'm not so much in favor of quotas, but uh, having at least one woman uh, in, in, in uh, important committees, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's an important thing. All right, do we have questions from the room? I have still some questions online, but okay, so online it is. So we have a question from one of our American uh, supporters, Laetitia de Cailleux, uh, who says, beyond the wonderful individual efforts some of you started and support, and if institutional inertia uh, and funding were not limiting factors, what would you prescribe should be done today to create meaningful change to have a much stronger pipeline of women mathematicians? Oh, that's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I have been thinking, sorry, so I have to read. Uh, yeah. So this is an issue I have been thinking uh, about uh, at least since 1987, and I still don't know. So you know, it's a hard question. So I, I wish that uh, you know uh, we came up with some uh, proposals. Uh, but, uh, not me. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a fundamental culture change that needs to happen, not just for women, but for for anyone who wants to succeed in math to feel that they have a path to do so um, really requires a fundamental culture change. So uh, the, the past AWM president uh, came up with this analogy of like, we've been fighting to get inside the house and now we're in it. And we're looking around and thinking that uh, some remodeling <laughs> needs to happen. And, and I think it's that. And I. I don't know that we know what pieces of the culture need to change, but things like um, there's a bit of a like macho-ness in math of like the more you suffer to do your math somehow, the, the, more, the more of a mathematician you are. I think that's a huge barrier for women and for other people. There's this idea that if that people who are, you know, high profile mathematicians were mathematical geniuses from the age of three. I mean, that's true for some, but it's certainly not true for all. Uh, maybe even the notion of genius itself needs to be reconsidered. I, I, I like, and this is not a problem just for math. I think this is a problem for academia. Um, that's a great question. And I'd love to have coffee with the asker someday so we can like <laughs> chat it out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Andrea, do you have something to add? Yeah, I think I would like to stress this uh, change in culture. So my two daughters that are six years apart, each of them came in their second class from school um, and said to me, well, do you know, mom, boys can do math better than, women, than girls. And it was just, I was working as a mathematician. So the whole so our home, there was no restriction that they can't do math, but the pressure from the society was so strong that they believe in this fact that boys can do math better than girls. And I, I think to really have a dramatic change, we have to change the attitudes to what, at that point already. So we have to start much earlier than at the university level. Yeah. No question here in the room, so I keep going. <laughs> uh, we have lots of questions coming in online. There's a, a very practical one. Uh, do you have practical advice on how to actively encourage organizers of events to invite more women, how to convince them? I mean, I think that's where places like IHES and MSRI and like all the math, it's like, where is the conference being held? Who's paying for it? And those people can be like, this is not a correct conference list. <laughs> you need to make some changes. I mean, that's a very low hanging fruit. But. 
following up with this, but it's always possible to, to find the speaker in this excellence panel that we were referring to. We, are, we very much want this to be true. So I was at the International Conference in Mathematical Physics. Uh, this question was posed to a panelist. Uh, why do you invite only two women out of 10 plenary speakers? And if I may say, two out of 10 in my community was already over-representative of the, of the platea of women. So, and someone told that they could have invited you, but it's not true. I'm a young researcher in a position it would have been very inconvenient for everyone, for myself, first of all, but for the whole community of women. So maybe on this respect of inviting people, maybe we can choose to have events where also junior researchers are more invited, and then, I think it was the case also this workshop, you can give more space to your junior, and maybe among the junior, the number of women has already increased very much. But to put the point, so I, I think we should wait a little bit more, right? And maybe in a moment do other activities to favor, I don't know, the, the increasing. Of, uh, otherwise, putting to too much high level people that are, maybe they will arrive at that level in 10 years, but not now, maybe a bit uh, uncomfortable for everyone. Do you want to have a remark to in response? Oh, uh, I think that's great. That's a great point. And in fact, we have taken that step of, uh, in our major conferences, having plenary speakers at the senior level and plenary speakers at the junior level. So that's a great suggestion. But I, I also feel like people, people who, or maybe I'm the only one who's guilty of this, people who sit down to organize conferences are doing this on top of their 60 hour a week job. And they're like, who do I know in this field? <laughs> OK, let's start with these people. And so I, I suspect that there are, with a small amount of effort, you could find more people. Um, but you have to be willing to put in, put in the effort. So Eva, yeah? Yes, I just wanted to say as a, uh, what Catherine said is uh, quite true. And uh, uh, also from my experience of being in uh, in, in such committees. So um, people sort of spontaneously start with the proposing man, but uh, if uh, somebody suggests to them, uh, preferably within the committee, uh, okay, so you didn't suggest any man, if you know some, so uh, myself, I can suggest some. And uh, so I found that it was not a problem. Uh, it's just that people don't think of them. Okay, and then, then you end up with uh, another percent or, or 80 percent uh, <laughs> men speakers, but uh, uh, if they stop uh, and think about it, uh, it's not hard, even at the senior level, but of course it's good to have uh, also junior level plenary speakers, it's, uh, it, that's even better because obviously there are more uh, women at the junior level. Andrea, do you want to add something? I think it's a question of awareness that the, the level of awareness rises. And I think we are on a good way with respect to this. So I'm in a few program committees for conferences, and I think a lot of committees are aware of this fact. There, it could never, no doubt, it could be improved, but I think it's really a question of awareness and that one takes the time to step back, look at the list, do we really cover all aspects? It's not only gender, it's diversity in general that should be taken into account here. Um, hello, my name is uh, Emilia Mboussa and I'm a student at uh, Paris Saclay for two years now. And I am studying mathematics. And I just would like to say that representation do matter because I never, I, I've always loved science since I'm a little girl, but I never considered mathematics as a project. Sure. Can you keep going? Let's see. Ah, yeah. Sorry. And um, I never considered mathematics as a, a job because I've, I didn't even think it was a possibility because I've never seen a woman being a mathematician. 
And uh, in high school, I had a um, female math teacher, and she like opened my eyes on the the, the on my future life. And then I knew that I wanted to do mathematics. And when I arrived in college, I thought that you know it was University of Paris Saclay, the greatest university in math. And I was quite disappointed that um, I had literally like no female uh, teachers in mathematics until this year. And when I saw her, I was like really thrilled because uh, I said to myself, it's possible, you can do it. She did it, so why can't you do it? And um, I think that particularly That. Our generation is very sensitive to this representation uh, matter because we know that nothing like legally can stop us from doing uh, any job. So why is there no one there? Like I can I mean like we can do it. So. Uh, why is there nobody there? We know that there is a problem, so it's not like, um, oh, you know, people don't see you as a woman, but it's also weird for us that there are no other women in the room, so we know that something is wrong. So this is, how, this is why we need to see women in things we like to do, because even though we don't believe in a, a role model in our life, uh, we are influenced by the things we see around us. So even though it should not be um, an obligation for institutions or university, you have to accept that um, you need females in high positions like teaching or other things because it's like um, really important. Thank you. Any comments? Your generation is great, and I can't wait to see what you do. And I'm really sorry that we who have come before you have not been able to pull the train up the track faster. So. Eva or Andrea, do you have a comment? Uh, no, I think that it's, uh, that's all. this is true that uh, you know, we need uh, role models. Uh, yes, yes, it's, it's very true. What she, she said is very true. I also completely completely agree with the importance of role model, and this is also the reason why I do, for example, why I'm, for example, the I'm the convener of EWM because we need to propagate this and I can just encourage all the women in leading positions to serve as a role model and make it public that's important that you talk to students that such that they see it that it's possible and that you also talk about your kids that you can do the career with kids and that this is important I think Thank you for this. Uh, we have another question coming online. Uh, so it's from Alejandra Quintos. Uh, and it says, she says, often it seems women's careers are subjected to uh, the careers of their partners. For example, in the US, it could occur as geographical constraints when looking for jobs. What are your thoughts on this? Yep. Go, Go ahead, Eva. <laughs> no, I, okay, so um, yeah, I'm very sensitive to this question because uh, I had this problem in my personal life. So it's definitely, uh, definitely a problem. And I have, uh, we, we talked about people, leaky pipeline. So I know several excellent uh, women mathematicians who had a great PhD and then gave up everything because their partner was in a place where uh, there was no enough for them. Uh, so I just don't know uh, how to solve this problem, but it is a very, very difficult and serious problem. Yeah, I just say this is one of those culture change things as well. I don't think it has to be that universities are organized in this way where 
you move across the country for graduate school or to an entirely different country, and then you do it again for your postdoc, and then maybe you do it again for another postdoc, and then you do it again for a position, and then here you might do it yet again for a full professor position. It's just um, incredibly destructive to your personal life to do that. Um, and it makes some pretty major assumptions about family structure. Um, to, to do that, and so I, I definitely would put this on the list of things that we should think about how we can fix. Andrea? Well, in Germany, at least at the two, two universities where I was a prof or where I am a professor, we had these partner programs where the university tries to organize something for the partner. It worked to some extent, but there's definitely room for improvement there, but this is something that can somehow help with this direction about the geographic problem of the partner. I, I, we have still a lot of questions. I don't know if we will have time to address it, them all, but I would like to share one question that came from uh, uh, Julia Decari, who will be our master of ceremonies at the, at the gala uh, in November um, in the US. She says, I wonder if panelists can comment on the situation of women in mathematics who are not white. <laughs> so first of all, uh, to answer the question about talking to people who've left math about why, uh, she has this amazing show where she's very clear about why she left. So she might, her show might be a, a place to start. Um, since I'm talking, maybe I'll keep talking. Uh, so I, I cannot speak as a woman who's not white in math because I'm a woman who's very white. Uh, however, uh, I follow people, uh, people who speak about these things. I've read a lot about it. Um, I've had conversations with people. Um, and what I can say is whatever it is that I've spoken about from my own life, uh, the things that they've endured are an order of magnitude more challenging. For example, um, I go to conferences and people want to take me on a date. Um, uh, <clears throat> not, uh, mathematicians of color that I know of go to conferences and they're assumed to be the cleaning staff or they're asked to leave because people, security thinks that they don't actually belong there and they're trying to steal. I mean, just the, the kind of going through a day, how many negative interactions do you have around your attempt to be a mathematician just skyrockets. Um, so I don't know if the question is about like how terrible is it or is it about what we can do? Um, but I think many of the culture change things that we've been talking about um, apply there as well. For So um, in our department, we've been really making an effort to break down barriers to access um, to computer science, but I think it's similar in math. Um, and the way that we start these conversations is to try to imagine the student who has the greatest list of obstacles to success in our institution and what does that student need so someone who, so college campuses are typically not built well for people who don't walk i mean like the amount of time it gets from point a to point b in a wheelchair i don't know how people make it in the passing period so people who are not white people who are i mean I, in the gender status i wouldn't put women at the bottom people who are trans or people who are gender fluid or you know like what are the assumptions being made about them so i think starting so when you're about to make a decision about something that you're going to implement starting from thinking about the person who needs the uh, most cultural change to be successful um, is a is a way to follow a guide, I guess. Thank you. Uh, perhaps even. So I, actually, I, that's a bit uh, different, but I am reading the uh, questions that uh, come on online. And so is it possible that I answer a question of a uh, young woman I actually know, <laughs> Marion Janin. So he says, she says something that I, I find quite uh, relevant. 
Uh, so I read her uh, text. I guess I'm getting tired of hearing that we can do it. Research is, research is underfunded and things are going uh, worse. We can make little girls coming into mass, uh, but what next? Okay, so this is, uh, um, of course, many people, uh, many young people say that. And this is also an obstacle that I encountered when I was a uh, uh, postdoc. So I said I was postdoc for 10 years, right? And uh, so that's a long time. Uh, my experience is that uh, finding postdocs uh, is not such a big problem. It may be uh, uh, for some people, uh, I don't know, but uh, it seems to me that they are even more uh, on offer now. And and also, I mean, for Mario, she could apply to IHS <laughs> she, if she's looking for another postdoc. So because we just said that this is a possibility. Yeah, but uh, it is. So for me, it was it was very, very hard uh, to, to stay a postdoc for 10 years, right? So it's also... Uh, Yes, when you're young, maybe you want to, to find family and so on. Uh, now, I mean, can we make institutions uh, to uh, offer more uh, permanent jobs? I think uh, this is not something that we can do. Uh, so when we say you can make it, so that means if you really want it, and if you are willing to be a postdoc for more years than you feel comfortable with, right? So it's not a very positive message, but uh, that's what I think. And also about little girls, also what Andrea said about her daughter. So I think these are things that uh, uh, they are a little bit beyond our control now, because it is that's really something that uh, one has to, go to, to do in course. And so I'm, I'm quite shocked to, to see that still today, I mean, uh, there are so many, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, gender typical uh, uh, pictures that are given to little girls, to little boys. So, uh, okay, when I was younger, I thought, okay, so in, in 40 years, it will be all over, and it's not. Uh, so, be, okay, it's, it is true that uh, uh, these inner pictures uh, have to be changed if we want a real, real change. No, then uh, I don't really have the recipe for that. Thank you. I I would also like to add on, to comment on this uh, chat entry. So I think it's not that we, well, from my point of view, it's important to get more um, women to study math and to do the PhD. And then it's not a question, and I'm sure if you have a PhD in math, then you get a good position. It might be that it's not at a university, but also in the industry, you can get a leading position then when you have a PhD in math. And I think this is, this is also one important point. So I completely agree that research is underfunded and there, there are not enough permanent positions, but it's also a point to bring more women in leading positions in industry. And that can be perfectly done with a PhD in math. And this is a good position, I would say. All right, so uh, time is running out. So uh, we have a final question from Sylvie Benzoni, who is director of Institut Henri Poincaré. And then we will uh, pass on to Mike for the concluding remarks. So the last question is, I think that ordinary sexism does a lot of harm with most men not even paying attention to it. Uh, could you share one piece of advice uh, tonight for, for this? Well, that's that's a difficult question, I would say. So I I already mentioned the awareness. So there's always so now it's this unconscious bias. This is all around. And I think this is really an important point to make people aware and to say, well, what you did right now was not I was not feeling well with this. To really clearly state this really helped men to also recognize that this was something that is not that was not correct to some extent. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe I can add something. <laughs> yeah, so uh, also through IHS, we uh, got to, to watch the movie Picture a Scientist. So it's a documentary movie. I found it excellent. So of course, I mean, maybe not everybody wants to, to, <laughs> to watch a movie that is more than an hour long. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I found it very, very convincing. Uh, so it explains, you know, this unconscious bias by many, many examples and, and special cases. So 
I think this is this is this really the sort of thing that can help. Uh, but then, of course, people have to watch it because otherwise it, it is, uh, doesn't uh, use it. They don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'll give a piece of advice because that's what I thought the question was. Um, and my advice would be to men. I feel like a lot of, ca of the... A lot of casual sexism comes out in groups of men and a lot of casual racism comes out in groups of white people. And so if you're someone in that group who feels like they understand uh, more than the other people in the group what the experience of that, of, of those people, the affected people are, um, speak out. Like you don't have to be a jerk about it, but men are much more likely to listen to men about things like this than they are to listen to us <laughs> because we're just whining and what's our problem and uh, them again, you know, like, but when, uh, when someone that they're friends with or um, have respect for or, uh, would think, would assume took their position, speaks out against it, I think it can be very powerful. Um, and then these changes don't happen, like, these changes don't happen in the one conversation. These changes happen over long periods of time. And so you can just think that you're planting seeds in people's minds about that could flower in the future. Uh, one very, very last question from uh, Lach. It's not a question, just a comment. So I should just would like to say that um, I'm very happy to be a mathematician. I don't feel that my male colleagues are my enemies. I think that's actually, I'm very happy in this community. And I think it's good to say it because else, girls will never come to mathematics. It's and true. so I'm much less pessimistic than you. I, I, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's a very strong message. Uh, we will uh, let Mike Douglas from Friends uh, from the Friends of IHES conclude. Um, thanks. Uh, I'd like to start uh, on behalf of all of us. I uh, thank uh, Andrea and Ava and uh, Catherine and our uh, moderator, uh, Meline, for a really extremely uh, informative uh, panel discussion. I learned a lot. And uh, I'd like to uh, also, they, 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 they represent these, these organizations, the Association for Women in Mathematics, the European Women in Mathematics are clearly doing extremely valuable and important work. And uh, one senses that there's just so much potential. Women have done so much already for mathematics and science and the potential that you know, is, is just there for so much more. And uh, it's really for all of us to uh, help them each in our own way, uh, academics, uh, scholars, researchers, uh, you know, the IHS has an important role to play and there were uh, many suggestions there. And uh, those of us who uh, support mathematics and uh, science have our role to play. Uh, programs, uh, conferences uh, led by women, uh, benefiting women, uh, other ways of helping uh, women and families, uh, childcare, all of these uh, require uh, funding. I'm the president of uh, Friends of IHES, uh, organization in the United States, and uh, we raise money for the IHES for uh, this and uh, many other purposes. And uh, we uh, very much want to be able to support uh, women visiting the IHES. So we would like to see the IHES put on meetings along the model set by the uh, AWM. And uh, we, uh, of course, accept uh, money at all times of year, but uh, we have a, a biannual gala coming up on uh, November uh, 16. I put a uh, link in the chat where you can find out more, but it looks to be an extremely, extremely uh, interesting uh, gala on the theme of uh, women in fundamental research. We'll have uh, Jan Levin, a renowned researcher in general relativity in the black holes as our keynote speaker. We'll have uh, Marilyn Simons, whose uh, philanthropy has done you know, a huge amount for science and mathematics and uh, for the cause of women in science. We'll have uh, Joya Dakari, who's a uh, playwright, a multi-talented uh, mathematician, playwright, actress, who will be our MC. Uh, there are many ways to uh, participate from uh, being there if you can come to New York to uh, online. And uh, I encourage you all to uh, check it out and uh, attend. Uh, and again, on, on, on behalf of uh, all of us in the IHS, I'd like to thank the panelists for this advice. I'd, I'd like to thank the EWM and the AWM for pointing the way 
I'd like to thank uh, Claire Lentz and uh, Julia Fafano and the IHES uh, development and communication team for uh, working to make this event uh, possible. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you, uh, the audience, for uh, attending this uh, really remarkable panel discussion. Thanks to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you.